Potato. Rose Parsnips? Does she think she's Gordon Oliver? Coming up, a special conference takes place to help our organisations identify the signs of child sexual exploitation. Details next. Chris joins them in the studio. Now the latest ITV News Central with Samina Ali Khan and Bob Warman. Hello and welcome to ITV News Central on the programme tonight. Nearly 500 reports of child sex abuse here in six months. Others say the real figure is much higher. I want people to come forward to tell us about this. This is a hidden crime. We need to know about it. Excited about the eclipse? A warning not to look directly at the sun. It cost this man most of his sight. Prince Harry's army heroes take on a new challenge on home soil. And on Budget Day, the Warsaw Schoolboy's winning design for the new one-pound coin. Good evening. Nearly 500 children in the West Midlands were identified as being victims of sexual exploitation in six months. That's according to new figures. Police say they have 70 investigations ongoing at the moment and 93 people are on bail. However, healthcare professionals attending a conference in Birmingham today were told the figures are an underestimation and hide the true scale of the problem. They were invited to the event alongside families of victims to learn more about how to spot the signs of a child being groomed. Stacey Foster reports. Remember, you are additional. This video is being shown to children under 16 in Birmingham to make them aware of how they could be groomed online and in person. And at this conference in the city today, doctors, nurses and social workers watching the same video and discussing how to spot the signs. It's a problem that we can't ignore and no matter how pressured our jobs are, I think it's a duty that us as GPs have to honour and have to take on our shoulders and think, OK, how do, how do we make the most of our 10-minute consultation or the most of our time in order to protect the people that are vulnerable out there? It comes after a report revealed 488 children in the West Midlands have now been identified as being a victim of child sexual exploitation. More than half of those are white girls. But today, the parents of a girl from a well-respected Sikh family say it can happen to anyone. She started to skip school. Um, she was making things up. By the time you've realised something's wrong, by the time you've realised your daughter is looking ill because she hasn't had any sleep or uh, the fact that uh, the perpetrators, the groomers themselves, have been uh, imitating uh, your voice to say that she must have a day off from school. We got to the point where we got very concerned that um, I took her to my GP and we were directed to go to a children's mental health clinic and unfortunately they missed all the signs. It was just an unruly child. Um, when this happens in an Asian family uh, what we've realised is the Asians still think this is a taboo subject and they won't discuss it. We give our kids all the education, in fact anything out there for them to try to develop themselves, that's what we did. We, had, we thought we had the perfect life. Despite all the evidence that's available to police and social services She's still adamant that she's not been groomed. These parents say there's only so much mums and dads can do and more needs to be done to educate children. And what we're determined to do about it is to ensure that all of the agencies are working coherently together to uh, support victims, to bring uh, perpetrators to justice and to work with schools, GPs and other community groups to really get the message out to them that there are warning signs that they need to look out for to support victims. In 2013, a gang of seven men were jailed for grooming young girls in Telford. 
Since then, the number of cases across the region has continued to rise. And I want it to keep going up. I want people to come forward to tell us about this. This is a hidden crime. And we need to know about it. So that number we will keep looking at. We will keep refreshing our data, our intelligence. I want people to come forward and tell us about it. West Midlands police say 800 officers, that's 10% of the force, are working on investigating child sexual exploitation and perpetrators will be brought to justice. Stacey Foster, ITV News. And there is more information and advice on identifying the signs that a child is at risk on our website, that's itv.com slash central. In his final budget before the election, the Chancellor, George Osborne, has boasted that a new job is being created in the Midlands every 10 minutes. He told a packed House of Commons his plans will energise businesses, families and save us. Labour insists most ordinary people are still hundreds of pounds worse off. Well, here are some of the headline announcements made today. The amount you can earn before paying tax is to rise from £10,600 to £11,000 by 2017. The first £1,000 of any interest on savings income you get will be tax-free. The government will top up by £50 every £200 you save for a deposit. Pensioners can swap their fixed annuities for a lump sum. And there's a penny off a pint of beer and 2% off cider and whisky duty. Well, the Chancellor then went on to announce new investment in our region. The Midlands is an engine of manufacturing growth, so we are today giving the go-ahead to the £60 million investment in the new energy research accelerator that they have sought, and confirming the new national energy catapult will be in Birmingham. And we're going to back our brilliant automotive industry by investing £100 million to stay ahead in the race to driverless technology. This is a budget people won't believe from a government that's not on their side because of their record because of their instincts, because of their plans for the future, and because of a budget, most extraordinarily, that had no mention of investment in our national health service and our vital public services. Well, in the West Midlands, a union representative expressed his disappointment at today's budget. Unison members in the West Midlands are going to be very disappointed by this dismal budget. What we were hoping for was we wanted to see the Chancellor tackle tax avoidance, but nothing's been done there. We wanted to see the Chancellor uh, put more money into the NHS, which is chronically underfunded, but nothing's been there, done there. And we also wanted to see the end of the scandal of the exploitation of people on zero hours contracts, but again, nothing's been done there. But Birmingham's Chamber of Commerce said some of the Chancellor's measures, like changes to the tax return, would benefit businesses. However, they still wanted more support to help the region's economy. You probably noticed the Chancellor probably gave as big a hint as possible that he's looking to uh, regions in, in the country and uh, he referred to the Northern Powerhouse. And I think now that that has been uh, hinted at, that we must move ahead now with creating that powerhouse uh, right across the Midlands. So, with 50 days to go till the election, the budget is likely to be a key topic of conversation between voters and those out on the campaign trail. At Westminster, our political correspondent Alison McKenzie has been getting reaction from Midlands MPs from all three main parties. 50 days until the election, three MPs from the Midlands to unpick the budget 2015. I'll start with you, Joan Wally, Stoke-on-Trent MP for Labour. Deficit coming down, jobs every 10 minutes being created in the Midlands. What's not to like about this budget? Well, it's a giveaway for those who have, but it does absolutely nothing for those who are really struggling. And it's clearly been devised with a general election in view. It says nothing about the health service, about the long-term issues of social care. And most of all, what does it say about public service and the extent of the cuts that we're going to be having between now and the next two years? Let's put that to Andrew Bridge in the North West Leicestershire Tory MP. P. Jones right, you've missed out whole sections of society. Well, as, as you said, Alison, the, uh, a job created in the middle is every 10 minutes. 80% of those jobs are full-time and 80% of the jobs are high-skilled. So that's just not, not correct. This is very much a budget of a Chancellor who hopes and believes that he'll be in office as Chancellor after the election. Uh, and in stark contrast to the last Labour budget before they were thrown out of office, where it was scorched earth.
Well, we're getting there into party politics. Liberal Democrat MP John Hemming, Birmingham Yardley. I have to put it to you, you're a Liberal Democrat in the boot of the Conservatives. You're just tagging along here. Well, well the, the fact is, it, it would be a Land Rover. It would have to be a Land Rover to be big enough for me. And Land Rover and manufacturing has done very well under this coalition government. And it's clear that we are in the driving seat because tax cuts for the low paid was a Lib Dem policy the Tories said was not possible. So it's clear we're in the driving seat there. We're in the driving seat in terms of more money for the health service, mental health, that sort of thing. This is not a Tory budget. This is a coalition budget. And we we have disagreements as to what to do in the general election. Joe Wally come in there, it is one against two, but they have a point, don't they? They're succeeding. Well, what they're saying is all about what they want to give away in terms of the general election. Um, what we should be doing is doing what's right for the country and right for ordinary working people. We talk about new jobs created. What about zero hours? We need all the safeguards that Ed Miliband actually talked about in his response to the budget today. Andrew Bridgen, you're also an employer. Joan is right there, isn't she? No, she's not. There's, right. there's about 600,000 people on zero hours contracts. Many people have got more than one zero contract. And we've actually reformed the, uh, the rulings on those so that they can't have exclusive zero hours contracts. Zero hours contracts suit some people. Students to allow them to study and older people who are retired, it, it suits some people's lifestyle. It's about rights at work and also it's about women. It's about what is in the budget for women and I don't see very much in the budget for women at all. Women struggling because of all the cutbacks in public services and the caring role that they have and the need to go out to work but there's more. Well. There's more women in work than has ever been Final under this government and, and also the gender pay gap has closed to the, 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 the tightest limit ever. Final word to John Hemming, the, it is right, important. more cuts to come John. Yeah, it's but what's most important is that we don't have to have an emergency budget after the general election because there's no money left. And, and the fact is, this is a plan. We would like to see the plan to spend a bit more on public services, a bit more for taxes for the higher paid. I'll have to stop you there. I think this discussion will continue afterwards. The election is just around the corner. The budget discussion will continue. But for now, that's it from Westminster. That's uh, so Alison McKenzie there reporting. And there is more on the budget in the national and international news which follows this programme. Now, in other news, the Leicestershire owners of an Irish setter wrongly thought to have been poisoned at Crofts have said the true facts surrounding its death may never be known. On Monday, it was revealed that Jagger, who died after returning to Belgium, could not have been poisoned while competing at the Crofts competition. The owners say they now wish to draw a line under the whole episode. You're watching ITV News. It's 12 minutes past six. Still to come on the programme, all smiles from Prince Harry as his army heroes embark on a new mission. And join me for your Midlands forecast. We'll be looking ahead to Friday morning and the solar eclipse. Get the latest details in a few minutes. Millions are expected to watch the eclipse on Friday as the moon covers much of the sun, turning daylight to dusk. In our region, the best time to view it is between 9.25 and 9.30 in the morning, that is. However, tonight, there are urgent warnings to drivers to take extra care, especially if they look into the sun without special glasses, because it could cause you to lose your sight. That's what happened to Bill Hanlon after he ignored the warnings, as Mike Pierce reports. Please be advised that a full report on my members' performances... Bill Hanlon lost 90% of his sight when he was a teenager. It was caused after he ignored warnings not to look at the sun during an eclipse. It's had an impact on his life ever since. I thought, well, nothing will happen to me, so I just had a quick look at the sun and that was it. Both eyes gone, centre, damaged. How much vision did it leave you with and how much vision do you have now? Oh, I've got a slight peripheral vision from the sides, which is about uh, about 10% if that, if that. I can't, I can't see, I'm not going to you now, but I can't see your face. So and that's vision. all because you looked at the eclipse yeah, and the sun? Yeah, so anybody who thinks they're going to look at it, take, think twice, look through ne negative or dark glasses, don't look at the negative eye, maybe like me. Even wearing sunglasses can still cause problems. Moorfields Eye Hospital deal with patients from every part of the country. Its experts say if you don't wear special protective glasses, you can fry your eyes. It's the infrared radiation from the sun that heats up the retina and fries it. Just like a magnifying glass on a bit of paper in the playground can burn a bit of paper, that's what the sun is doing when it's focused by your lens onto your retina. So you want to get proper uh, eclipse viewing glasses that are easy enough to buy. Uh, don't look through smoked glass, don't look through a telescope or binoculars. 
um, people will generally want to photograph it with their iPhones or look through the iPhones and that's again acceptable in that it's not directly looking at the sun with the naked eye. In the UK there'll be a partial eclipse on Friday morning with the moon covering up to 90% of the sun at around 9.30. Drivers are also being warned of the dangers. If your car hasn't got automatic headlights you might need to switch headlights on. Um, pedestrians in particular need to make sure they can be seen. Um, it will be unusual. The main thing is drivers should not be distracted um, and, and cause an accident and there is that risk people might be looking around wondering what's going on. While we'll see a partial eclipse on Friday to see a total full eclipse you'll have to travel some 300 miles north of Scotland to the Faroe Islands and that's where thousands of people are going the so-called eclipse chasers. In the Faroe Islands you're going to get 100% uh, solar eclipse Whereas if you've gone to Iceland, apparently it was only 98, so I opted to go to the Faroe Islands. A uh, hell of a lot of interest. Uh, we believe there's 9,000 going to the Faroes uh, this week, so that's going to probably triple or quadruple the population of the island anyway. I think it's going to be cloudy and rainy, but we'll still experience it and be with other people enjoying it. It's a very rare phenomenon. Bill Hanlon says he's made the most of his life with impaired vision thanks to his family. Their warning is simple. I'd say, listen, don't do what you think is okay. Looking up at the sun, make sure your eyes are protected, because look what happened to Bill. Don't. Make sure you do wear glasses. Don't look at the sun, because otherwise you'll end up like me, and it can stop you doing a lot of things you may want to do. I, I've been lucky, really. I've got a good wife and good family, so they, look, they supported me throughout my life, so I'm quite happy. But don't look at the sun, the naked eye. Mike Pierce, ITV News. So a stark warning there, and in fact on our website we've got a do's and don't list on how to safely watch the eclipse. Go to itv.com slash central for the details on that. And you'll also find five fascinating facts from our weather presenter Lucy Kite about the forthcoming eclipse. Lucy, by the way, will be along later in the programme with a forecast for the next few days, including Friday. Now, Shaw Taylor, the creator and presenter of Police 5 for many years on this channel, has died at the age of 90. The crime-fighting mini-programme began in 1962 in London, but it quickly expanded to the southeast and also to here in the Midlands. Well, Andy Bevan has been looking back at his career and he joins us now. Uh, Andy, best known for Police 5, of course, but uh, Shaw Taylor had been on screen long before that, hadn't he? Yes, indeed he had. Uh, he was a rather trained actor and he appeared in many TV plays and films. And he was uh, one of ATV's first announcers back in 1957 when the channel first started. And um, before that, he was uh, an RAF operator, radio operator during the Second World War, and he helped to drive the Japanese out of Burma. After his time in the forces, he studied drama and won parts in productions like Sunday Night Theatre and British films like X the Unknown. And then there was his stint as a game show host on ATV's Pencil and Paper. If anybody else on the other side of the channel is receiving pencil and paper on their television sets, well, please do write in and let us know because we'd like to hear from you. Well, he was there at the start of ATV and he was there on the 31st of December 1981 when ATV became central, signing off with announcer Mike Prince. Today, he and fellow presenter Bob Hall reminisced about those days. Always debonair, always very smartly dressed, um, you'd see him sometimes if you went into the, the washroom, maybe in front of the mirror, adjusting the cravat all the time before he went out. I just said, you know, you would have a curiosity. I said, anybody at RADA with you that, that I would know? John Collins? Do you need another name? <laughs> But from the early 1960s to the mid-1990s, Shaw Taylor was the face of Police 5. It was originally commissioned to fill a gap in the programme schedules and was only supposed to run for a couple of weeks. But Shaw's unique way of coming across almost as a real investigator was a hit with the viewers and it got results for the boys in blue. The man came out of the box, followed the cashier down here, suddenly tapped him on the shoulder and as the cashier turned... He got the contents of a squeezy bottle straight in the face. And, of course, his weekly sign-off became one of the most well-known in the country. So I will... Keep peel. Keep peel. Bye-bye. 
<laughs> well, Andy was certainly a one-off, and I know both you and Bob worked with him. Um, what was he like as a, as a colleague? Well, I worked with Shaw in the 1980s, and I was a rookie film editor then. And uh, back in those days, the sound for the film was recorded directly onto the film. It's quite a hard thing to do, but Shaw Taylor would go out, get the cameraman to set up his first shot, the camera would roll, Shaw would say his sentence directly onto the film, then they'd stop. The cameraman would then position for the second shot and roll again and Shaw would pick up in the middle of the sentence and as, as an editor, when you came to put it all together, it was an absolute doddle because he'd already done it. He was an absolute professional. <laughs> yeah, bet, bet some of the editors wish we'd do that now, actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Bobby had some wise words of wisdom for you, didn't he, well, when you started? Indeed, he, he, he took me under his wing for a very short time and uh, he, uh, he said, um, whatever you do, don't have a desk of your own. I said, why, Shaw? And he said, well, they'll always know if you're not there. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you had a great sense yeah. of humour. Yeah. Andy, yeah. thank you very much. Now, just moving on. A group of injured servicemen and women will take part in a 1,000 mile walk around the UK this summer. Among them, Stuart Hill, a former Mercian Regiment commander. The trek will be in aid of the charity Walking with the Wounded and was launched by its patron, Prince Harry, earlier. Yes, the route will pass through parts of the West Midlands and as David Wood reports, it's not the first challenge in aid of the charity. As an Afghan veteran, the Prince knows the threat these men and women faced. They all left the front line with life-changing physical or mental injuries. Among those taking part in the 1,000-mile challenge is Midlander and former Mercian Regiment commander Stuart Hill. He suffered a traumatic brain injury after an explosion in 2009. I've become reactive to work and the opportunities of work, not proactive. I don't have the energy um, to hold down employment or to look and search and grab opportunities for work. Um, I'm hoping um, that some opportunities will be created from this. He is one of five soldiers taking part in the expedition, where they'll be joined by other veterans, scouts and members of the public. The charity trek is all about helping to build independence for wounded soldiers as they leave the army. These men and women want to continue to serve their country in whatever way is possible. PTSD and mental injury can make life a daily struggle. There seems to be a general consensus amongst the public that most people leaving the military are damaged goods. Well, this couldn't be further from the truth. And wounded veterans have already proven that in the name of the charity. Groups have made it to the South and North Poles and to the summit of Everest. And while this challenge will be in the much warmer UK, it'll be just as tough. It's a thousand miles. Um, we've got some quite big hills to climb. We've got a, and it's a long distance, a lot of it on road. It's pretty punishing on your feet. So it's, uh, I have absolutely no doubt it's going to be very, very hard work for the, for the main team. And as for the Prince, well, it's a challenge he's forcing himself to take part in too. Uh, I'm delighted to say that I will be joining the team for a small part of their journey and I'm hugely looking forward to it. Thank you. So they all have just five months to get in shape for the challenge. And while this one won't be as life-threatening as the previous ones, every step will be just as difficult and rewarding. David Wood, ITV News. Well, talking about getting fit for it, football. Wolves moved to within three points of the playoff places in the championship after a 3-0 win against Sheffield Wednesday last night. Bakary Sacco opened the scoring from the spot after Nua Dicko was brought down in the area. After the break, Benic Afobi volleyed home to double their advantage before James Henry sealed the points to complete an important win. Derby dropped to fifth in the championship after another disappointing result against Middlesbrough. The only goal of the game just after the hour mark from Patrick Bamford, who was on loan at Derby last season. It means Steve McLaren's side are now five games without a win. And in League One, Coventry left it late against Fleetwood, but two goals in the last two minutes means they register back-to-back -back wins for the first time since September. Port Vale lost at home to Crawley and Walsall, prepared for their trip to Wembley on Sunday with a one-all draw against promotion-chasing Sheffield United. Researchers want the public to help study why the number of bees is falling. Bees play a vital role in our countryside, pollinating fruit and vegetables. However, many native species are declining rapidly. Malcolm Shaw has been to find out more. 
A beautiful spring morning and Kate Arms is heading for her greenhouse. Kate is taking part in a project to find out why the number of bees is declining. She'll be growing broad beans and radishes, pollinating some by hand and leaving others to the bees to see which do best. I've read a lot about the problems with the bee population and I think a lot of people are more concerned about where their food's coming from now. So it seemed an opportunity to perhaps contribute to the wider knowledge about bees. Um, I'm not a scientist, but in a small way, maybe I'm helping. PhD student Linda Birkin is coordinating the study. She says the citizen science project will give a much broader picture of how bees are doing than researchers could otherwise obtain. For doing a UK level study, it's imperative pretty much to be able to use the, the public because there aren't that, you know, there's not that many people working on bees, um, not many scientists working on bees that would be able to do this, uh, and certainly not on that geographical scale. Bees play an essential role in the environment, pollinating many of the fruits and vegetables on which we depend. But many of our native bee species are struggling, some already extinct. We've gradually lost flowers from the countryside. Intensive farmland doesn't really have much in the way of flowers. So there's no food for bees in the modern world. Um, and then on, on top of that, they're exposed to lots of pesticides these days and there's a big controversy about how big a role that's playing in, in contributing to their declines. And then on top of that, we've rather foolishly introduced lots of bee parasites from other countries as we've moved bees around. 550 volunteers like Kate are taking part in the project along with 30 schools. It's hoped the data they collect will give a clearer picture of why bees are struggling and what we can do to help them. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News. Now news that the pound in your pocket is changing and it's not just because of today's budget. A teenager from Warsaw has designed the brand new one pound coin which will be introduced across the country. 15 year old David Pierce's design was picked from more than 6,000 entries and he was personally congratulated by the Chancellor George Osborne. David's coin will be lining our pockets from 2017. I'm delighted really. It's amazing to have my design recognised nationally and for it to be on the new one pound coin. Well, it's just like it's not something that will come around <laughs> again really. That's a great boast to have, isn't yeah, it, for nice. David? Yeah. I designed that and yeah. pull out a load of pound coins. Yeah. Now, anyway, if you happen to have stayed up into the early hours of this morning, you may have caught a rare glimpse of the passing of the Northern Lights. These photos were taken in Shropshire by Christopher Burridge. Stargazers from across the Midlands reported sights of the Aurora Borealis. Forecasters say it's the largest solar storm to have happened in 11 years. A huge spike in solar activity meant that more people than ever before were able to witness the displays. Don't they look great? They do indeed. So, well, let's take a look at the uh, weather forecast now with Lucy. What's in store for today? ITV Local Weather, sponsored by Centre Parks. Hello again. Well, a breathtaking picture for you tonight. Taken at the Malvern Hills by Frank Hickman. We can see the clouds rolling in there and there will be rather a lot of cloud as we head towards the weekend. Tomorrow not looking bad though, probably the best day of the week for sunshine. Tonight, well, when we get to the early hours of the morning, the cloud will start to build. We'll see some misty low grey cloud as well. So potentially poor visibility by tomorrow morning if you are heading out first thing on the roads. Temperatures dipping to freezing points or very close. The potential for a touch of ground frost overnight tonight. So tomorrow morning, quite a chilly fresh start. Grey and cloudy too. We've got those mist patches first thing, but they'll quickly lift and break. And in the afternoon, an improving picture. Plenty of sunny spells to look forward to. Staying dry across the whole of the Midlands tomorrow afternoon as well. And temperatures responding nicely in the sunshine, 9 or 10 degrees Celsius. So a similar feel to this afternoon, but more in the way of sunshine. Light winds tomorrow as well, but we're chasing the cloud around for the rest of the week. Bye for now. ITV Local Weather, sponsored by Centre Parks.
And just before we go, a reminder of tonight's top stories on ITV News Central. Nearly 500 children in the West Midlands were identified as being victims of sexual exploitation in the past six months. That's according to new figures. Healthcare professionals attending a conference today were told the figures are an underestimation. The Chancellor, George Osborne, has boasted that a new job is being created in the Midlands every 10 minutes. He delivered his final budget today before the election, saying his plans will energise businesses, families and save us. And tributes have been paid to Shaw Taylor, the creator and presenter of ITV's Police 5 show, who died aged 90. A long and successful life. That's it from us. Join us tomorrow at the usual time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Osborne says we're walking tall again as a nation. His budget throws down the election gauntlet to Labour. There's help for savers and the low paid. A hit on the wealthy, saving for a pension and a boost for first-time buyers, raising a deposit. This is the budget for Britain, the comeback country. Yeah! But with an independent warning of a roller coaster ride of cuts ahead, Labour says it won't stack up. This is a budget people won't believe from a government that's not on their side. Also tonight, 17 tourists die in Tunisia as gunmen open fire at a museum in Tunis. And the Royal Travellers, Charles and Camilla, stride through American history in Washington, D.C. This is ITV News at 6.30 with Alistair Stewart and Mary Nightingale. Good evening. With 50 days until the general election, this was always going to be an intensely political budget. George Osborne's rhetoric was clear. Britain's a nation walking tall once more that faces big choices. He trimmed the deficit a little and managed to cut taxes, help savers and give first-time buyers a helping hand. But Labour said the numbers didn't add up and the Independent Office of Budget Responsibility warned of a roller coaster ride ahead with big cuts still to come. Our political editor Tom Bradby on the Chancellor's final budget before May's general election. In the days...